Hey everybody, Evan Kerstell here. Super excited for this talk today about connecting everything everywhere with the Internet of Things today uh, with Teal. Uh, Robbie, how are you? Great. Nice to meet you, Evan. Nice to meet you. You're a company I'm really intrigued by and I'm, I'm, I've been looking forward to diving deep with you, not just on the technology, but your, your journey at Teal. Um, maybe introduce yourself and the technology behind Teal uh, uh, as we get started. Yeah, so I'm the founder, one of the founders. I'm, the, I'm a product first founder. I'm also the CEO. Uh, my background before starting Teal was in some of the very first eSIM deployments of the MTEM technology, uh, working on uh, General Motors, Daimler, different projects, uh, and not really seeing the space accelerate like I wanted it to, not really seeing the full potential of eSIM. Uh, brought out to market. So started a company together with my co-founder to, to solve that problem. And uh, Teal is essentially like an app store if you're an enterprise where you can install different networks. So we serve different uh, cellular networks uh, with a different approach to how you might see aggregators in the past you use a lot of roaming. You know, you've got, um, you know, the holograms and the Twilio's and the cores and those kind of companies that are doing mm. a lot of roaming technologies. We don't run any infrastructure, so it's all about putting devices directly into those networks. Yeah, it's super interesting. And you're GSMA certified, so you've got the official uh, seal of approval as far as interoperability goes. Um, so, so how does the network work? How does your platform work? What makes it unique in the IoT space today? Yeah, so we're the first and only uh, North American company to be certified by the GSMA. So there's a very small number of software platforms out there that actually have source code for how eSIM works. Most of them mm. are card vendors based in Asia or Europe. And, uh, you know, we're kind of the scrappy underdogs, right? So we're, de we're definitely um, the youngest company on that list. Um, the technology works uh, in a little bit, uh, a few different ways than how the, the default uh, technology works. A lot of uh, legacy systems or things built on the just raw standards use a lot of texts and SMS in order to, to reprovision users. We think that, uh, and I had hands-on experience where uh, using binary roaming text messaging, I'm going to use a lot of acronyms because it's telco, right? I've been in telecom telecom for 30 years. We love four yeah. and five letter acronyms are the best if you got a few yes. of those. I mean, yeah. Hopefully M to M isn't just mobile to mobile, it's machine to machine now. You got the AIoT, all kinds of things. But um, a lot of binary roaming SMS was used in the past, um, but it meant that networks had to do like SMPP binds in the eSIM platforms and just things that really slowed down the projects. Um, and so uh, we built our own platform so that we could do things better. We use HTTPS, we use data only mechanisms, which mean we're compatible with things like satellite and NB-IoT and uh, 5G SA networks that might not use uh, CS connection anymore. Um, so anyway, we, we've just kind of taken the next step forward to make things really scalable. Um, we're building this kind of ecosystem of operator partners uh, where it's not something that is replacing their go-to-market or it's not replacing how they're approaching IoT solutions, but it's, it's being a value add to them. That's fantastic. And your claim to fame is you have more network operator agreements than any other connectivity provider. I think you talk about 3,500, if I'm correct. How on yeah. earth did you achieve that? And, yeah. you know, tell we us about 3, the benefit. 3,500 different <laughs> profiles in the system. So 3,500 wow. is the number of roaming uh, connections that you could use, use. So it's the number of possible radio networks. Um, right. We have 30 plus, like, direct networks. So that's... This is a big part of why we call it an app store and why, why we invented this concept of like a network app. A lot of times people just think about like radio coverage when they think of a cellular network. So they're thinking like, oh, I can get access to AT&T. Yeah, you're getting on the tower, but who's infrastructure, right? Who's, uh, what features does that come with? Um, so when we uh, integrate a profile directly, we're getting all the features like 5G standalone networking, slicing ultra wide band networks uh, or ultra wide band spectrum um, just features that you don't get when you're roaming onto something so 3500 is like the full footprint of how many network and paths we can deliver um, obviously there's only 800 networks in the gsma so there's only 800 mm -hmm. uh, lte or 5g networks possible 
um, but there's redundant paths and each one comes with different features. So some might uh, be able to connect on multiple networks. Some profiles can roam uh, between uh, different countries, um, but definitely uh, our, our uh, claim to fame is just that we're very easy to work with. We have a big ecosystem of these network partners. We just announced something with T-Mobile last week. Uh, we're the only solution in North America that gives you direct access to AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile all at a click of a button. Click of a button. Wow. That means you actually get an IP address from those carriers. It's not our data centers. It's not aggregated through some wholesaler. It's literally from those operators and using their full technology stack. Well, that's so impressive to me as a geek, but maybe translate that into the business value. How does that uh, benefit a business? Is it the, you know, switching across networks is needed? You know, what are the applications that you're seeing yeah, drive usage? It sounds really cool and it is, for consumers, uh, you know, like a regular user like you or I on our phones, uh, we can't really use this sort of technology to its full approach because we're, we spend most of our time in a full coverage area from one of those networks. So the, yeah. the carriers don't really let this kind of solution happen on consumer land. There's solutions like Google Fi that might use some kind of roaming and some aggregation layers to pull it off, but you're certainly not accessing the real networks when you're accessing something like Google Fi. For IoT, yeah. The problems are different. So um, a drone might need a uh, like crystal clear 20 uh, megabits per second uplink minimum. And some networks might be able to deliver that in certain metros and some might not be able to deliver that. So what are you going to do? You're going to build three or four different versions of your drone and pick and choose mm -hmm. and do site surveys as to what you're going to use in a, in a uh, geography. Or you can use technology like Teal you're going to get the native network. You're going to be able to switch in real time to whatever network is best at that at that moment. So anything that's going to be uh, performance sensitive, anything that's mission critical, where you want to have backup IP addresses, right? You want to have mm. uh, redundant networking paths to use. If if there's a regional outage, you know, Timo goes down in Texas, you can switch over to one of the other networks. Also, just if you're thinking about energy companies, another application would be there's such a broad deployment geography across the whole nation, maybe some areas, some neighborhoods are going to be able to connect where uh, other carriers can't. And you, instead of having to do a site survey and figure out what's better or best at that time, uh, this technology lets people use all of it. So it's, it's totally neutral. People can pick and choose what they want to do uh, and configure it all remotely. That's fantastic. Uh, do you have any use cases in an area near and dear to my heart, which is healthcare, IT, you know, remote patient monitoring, you know, in hospitals or, or hospitals at home? That must be an area that you're seeing some interest from. Yeah, definitely. Um, we do some work in private networking, too, like private LTE. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's been something that's uh, picked up as far as the indoor cellular initiative in hospitals. There's a lot of... Uh, devices that want to get connected, but are hardwired because the radio is just repeating the same Wi-Fi bands over and over, the same channels, and you're not able to uh, enroll as many devices in the radio as you'd want to. Um, certainly, um, like we've seen some demand for uh, clinical trial assistant mm -hmm. devices. So like a tablet that goes home where somebody can report their symptoms back to the clinic or can video chat with a doctor very easily. Um, wow. That's something where cellular makes sense. I was alarmed. My um, my uh, father in law has a um, like a cardiotherapy device installed, wow. and it uses Bluetooth to a Wi Fi bridge. And I was like, why would this thing not be independently connected? Why does this go down at the same time Netflix goes down in the house? Oh, right, like yeah, having yeah. some kind of uh, cellular failover. I think. Uh, cellular technology is really good for mission critical applications, and certainly healthcare is one of those one of those categories. Yeah, very nice. So the freedom to choose your network, obviously, pretty cool technology. But what what about saving money and the economics of how that works without getting into like actual dollars and cents? Yeah, we what's we your cut out, there? We cut out the middleman, right? So typically, you would have. Um, a subscription that comes like in the in the particle boards, right? They're they're a pretty popular dev board for IoT applications. They include a SIM card. It comes from a Movistar out of Switzerland, so it's it's roaming onto a U.S. network using a Swiss identity, which is uh, obviously not as 
economically beneficial as connecting on a US network with a US identity. So by making uh, these networks more accessible, we're making better price points accessible. If you're a US business, you might not have the ability to get a Brazilian SIM card very easily, or you might use your or attempt to use your US SIM card in Brazil, it's going to pay higher rates just the same way you visit another country and you're paying higher rates for your consumer line. IoT devices have that same problem. And as long as we can distribute as many different possible profiles at 30 plus profiles, the 3,500 networks, take that off the table for a second, but like 30 plus profiles, that means we're able to optimize per region the cost, we're able to, to optimize the performance, but it, it, it can result in big deployment savings for sure. That's fantastic. Let's talk about eSIM technology. It's it's still, you know, sort of best kept secret out there, I think, yeah. despite being in, you know, latest Apple and Samsung phones. Why is that? And, and um, you know, when I show my eSIM, I have five different eSIMs to, you know, friends and family. They're like amazed. That yeah, that's even available. What does it take to, you know, educate businesses around eSIM technology? and how it can be used. I imagine that's part of your sales cycle as well. Yeah, I mean, for enterprise and for these machine devices, eSIM is a leg in front of consumer devices because just the way that contracts work in consumer mm -hmm. land and the preservation of ARPU and the way that the telcos want to lock you into contracts, they want to lock you into their network, They they see themselves as like the one and only solution for a consumer. Uh, enterprise is a little different because you're not just covering one person, you're covering thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even a global deployment of technology. And now there's regulations that say you must use a local SIM card when you're in Brazil or in India or in Germany. And eSIM kind of was developed out of necessity for those enterprise cases. As soon as, uh, Anybody deploying an IoT device learns that they can have the same commercials, the same access and performance that mm. a native SIM card would give them, but with this digital flexibility. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty easy seller. It's a pretty easy um, conversion. So it's all about educating um, what access you get um, and what why that matters. That's the whole network apps thing. Like, do you do you want to have a roaming connection, the AT and T, that's not going to give you all the bands? Or do you want to have like the real, the real deal, the full uplink, all the packet gateways, all the pops? Um, in consumer land, I think it's going to be like this <laughs> for for a <laughs> while. Um, I would like to see more digitization because you still have to do like the in store activations for a lot of yeah. um, a lot of stuff just because of SIM hijacking. Personal identities have a lot more uh, financial impact. If somebody hijacks like a water meter. They're not walking into a bank and signing a mortgage, right, um, with that water meter identity. But because uh, so much of our social media and digital footprints are tied to those phone numbers, people are just really careful about uh, switching networks and, and porting numbers around. And I think it's going to stay kind of at this pace for consumer land. But like I said, enterprise, I think uh, it's more of a technology first solution. The, the, the things are are headless units that need to be able to go anywhere. So it's different. Amazing. Well, you solved a major challenge that businesses have in IoT deployments. What are some of the other challenges? Are you going to take some of the other challenges on? You've got the one click kind of provisioning and deployment. Um, what else is hindering IoT, do you think that, uh, or what could be done to accelerate that? Uh, I mean, fragmentation is a word that uh, mm -hmm. gets thrown around a lot. But um, fragmentation is still, like just in terms of compatibility layers, we've yeah. done uh, things where there's like broker services, brokerage services where we can convert like a, a co-app protocol uh, into an MQTT protocol. So like co-app mm -hmm. lightweight M to M is not compatible or sorry, is how NBIOT networks communicate but MQTT is how a lot of the server applications were, were designed to receive messages. It's an it's a easier um, protocol to, to integrate. Um, so there's some compatibility layers. As far as what Teal's focus on doing, you know, we did that. A few customers need it. 
But fragmentation being such a controversial topic, I mean, just design your solution with matching hardware and cloud mm. designs, right? If you have two different product teams, maybe you end up with that fragmentation, but just getting smarter about that. I think in IoT, there's a lot more complete solutions being built, which is sweet. Um, and then a lot more like deep, deeper, um, more specialized uh, solutions. I think people that get stuck in the middle where they try to do a little bit of everything, but not very well, that's where IoT really grinds to a halt because all of a sudden you have to pay, you know, a higher uh, materials cost just to have the right cloud application because you have to buy the right equipment from them. Um, I'd like to see more interoperability uh, and Teal's always going to be trying to solve that sort of thing. Yeah, very, very nice. And what, what's on your mind on the future of IT connectivity? You know, what role do you see yourself playing, you know, over the next year, two, three? What's on your mind as far as where this space is going? Yeah, there's a new technology called SGP32 uh, coming out, which is a consumer eSIM for IoT, which is very confusing because already it was confusing that there's two different versions of eSIM, the one in your phone, consumer, mm -hmm. and the one in a plastic a chip or a embeddable chip called uh, M2M, but they're push first pull. So your, your iPhone scans QR code and that's how it works. In M2M today, uh, a server pushes a change to a card or a chip, uh, which means it's remotely manageable, but it also means that the, the chip needs to be pre-configured with the, that server in mind. This new standard means that uh, any eSIM in IoT land could join any kind of management server. Uh, and so Teal's building a lot of tools to make that very easy. Um, so I'm very excited about that on our, on our roadmap. A um, lot of companies pretending that they have SGP32 solutions today. Uh, there's not even product certifications uh, defined yet, so nobody can launch anything for the next year and a half. But... Um, That'll be a very exciting topic. If people are fans of the eSIM space, you know, look at some of the dialogue that's happening with SGP, SGP32, the, uh, the GSMA standard. Of course, they named it as GSMA always does. Very, yes. very catchy. Very, very catchy. Rolls name. off the tongue. Yep. <laughs> so you're in Seattle. Seattle's kind of become the global headquarters of wireless innovation of Microsoft and T-Mobile and Amazon and... Are, yeah, are you a child of all that innovation? Are you, you must benefit from a lot of the ecosystem that's in and around Seattle these days. Yeah, definitely. My, my dad worked for AT&T here at Redmond Town oh, Center wow. for a very long time, uh, was at Macaw and whatnot before. So, I mean, people, yeah, 4G, 5G, 3G, all the way back, uh, Edge even, like the Pacific Northwest has had a rich history of, of telco. And I don't think it gets enough credit. I mean, you've got Atlanta, New Jersey, <laughs> and then you got Seattle really as, as the areas. But obviously with the cloud providers being hosted here, I think it's a great place to be for, uh, for the IoT and digitization future. Yeah, I, I would agree. So what are you excited about over the next few weeks? Any personal travel, professional travel? I know you're at the big 5G event. Uh, coming up in, in September, October in Las Vegas. Yeah, there's what MWC on your... coming up. That's a big one. Um, there's a few like drone shows and whatnot that we're going mm -hmm. to. Um, I've got a board meeting in, in <laughs> uh, Coeur d'Alene or um, Spokane area, like Eastern Washington. So uh, I don't have a whole lot of travel. I just uh, got back. I was in Europe for a couple of weeks, still working though, you know, still working. So uh, we do have a, a pretty big announcement coming on the SGP32 front. Uh, so that would be something to watch for. It's uh, a partnership with a, a pretty big uh, established brand. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm a founder, so I don't really take vacations. It's, it's always <laughs> working. So I get it. So much uh, appreciate the time sharing your vision and mission. It's super exciting. And thanks, everyone, for watching. Feel free to reach out to Teal. Any questions, comments, feedback? Um, really interesting folks. Well, take care, Bobby. Thanks so much. Thank you, Evan. Huge, huge fan of the show. Thanks for having me.